would just quickly like to introduce our panelists. Uh, of course, first our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. David Setter, who I think is the, one of the foremost uh, experts on Russia. So we're very delighted that he can be with us today and also he's, uh, that he could become a visiting fellow of the Danube Institute. So thank you very much for that. And we're very, look, very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on, uh, on the war. Uh, and we also have uh, joining us as uh, respons uh, respondents uh, to uh, his talk, we have uh, first uh, Dr. Attila Demko, who's uh, the head of the Center for Geopolitics at the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, MCC. Uh, I think he's also very distinguished in uh, Hungary as one of the, again, as David is a foremost expert on Russia, he's one of our foremost experts on geopolitics, so I'm very much looking forward to his uh, remarks here. And last but certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Hayward, who is, uh, of course, a political commentator, uh, an author, uh, a scholar, uh, and who also teaches at the University of California, Berkeley, and who also is now uh, gracing us with his presence as a visiting fellow of the Danube Institute. So thank you for coming. Uh, first, I would kindly ask uh, uh, Dr. Setter to deliver his opening remarks, and then uh, uh, I think first Attila and then Stephen could respond, and then afterwards I think I will have a couple of questions and then we can open it up to the audience. So please uh, join us. <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I think everything that is going on in the world now is to a certain extent under the shadow of the uh, terrible news from the Middle East. But I think this makes the discussion that we're going to have about the war between Russia and Ukraine all the more important because, in fact, as different as Hamas and the Putin regime may seem to some people, they're actually two variants of the same phenomenon. What we have is a death cult in both places. I mean, we've seen and, and been horrified by the reports from Israel of the slaughter of innocent civilians. But in fact, uh, this is actually different in degree, but not in kind from what is happening in the occupied areas of Ukraine. And it reflects the same mentality that's expressed in the human wave attacks that have been mounted by Russia with uh, nearly 90 to 95% uh, casualties uh, with for little or no military uh, gain. The um, situation obviously in the world is becoming more and more dangerous and I think under these circumstances the need to define our values, what we consider important, what we're ready to fight for and stand for is more important than ever. The, the war that has been now going on for almost, uh, well, will soon be two years actually, the full-scale war between Russia and Ukraine, is often justified by the Russians on the grounds that Ukraine is not a country. <laughs> But in fact, uh, this is not true. This is information for people who are not very well informed about Russian history. In fact, if Ukraine is not a country, then Russia is not a country either because they were created at the same time. Uh, both the Russian Republic, so-called, and the Ukrainian Soviet Republic were created in, in 1923. It's 100 years ago when the Soviet Union was constituted. When the Bolsheviks seized power, they were concerned to dismantle the Russian Empire. And the way to do that was to split it up along national lines. But they never intended that the newly independent national republics should slip out of Russian control. The device that they, de that they, that they invented in order to solve this, this conundrum was to define each of the national republics, including the Russian Republic, as an independent state, and then present the Soviet Union as a collection of voluntarily uh, uh, united independent countries. 
In fact, this, 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 took, this became very comical after the end of the Second World War when Stalin said he wanted 15 seats at the United Nations. And it took a, a lot of bargaining to get him to accept only three seats, the Russian Republic, the Ukrainian Republic, and the Belarusian Republic. The, um, the Soviets were able to do this because they operated on the idea that what united all these countries was Marxism-Leninism. Uh, and in fact, after the Soviet Union was created, there was an efflorescence of national culture in each of the republics. Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language and culture, which had been suppressed, was suddenly encouraged. Newspapers, theater, instruction in the schools, teaching in the universities, all of this was uh, suddenly not only legal, but actually viewed with a certain amount of approval. But the catch was that all of the national republics which were indulging their, which were expressing their national languages could only do so within the framework of communist ideology. In other words, you were free to read Marx and Lenin in Ukrainian, in Belarusian, in Armenian, in Georgian, but you weren't free to read anything that contradicted Marx and Lenin. In 1985, when Gorbachev came to power and decided that the Soviet Union needed access to free information in order to overcome economic stagnation, he created a situation in which for the first time people were able to uh, appreciate their national cultures independent of Marxist-Leninist ideology. And a conflict was opened up in a world of lies between the, the reigning mendacity on the one hand and truthful information on the other. And it became clear to all who were watching it, and I was one of those. In fact, uh, during those years, I was writing regularly for National Review, and the editor was none other than our John O'Sullivan, and he and I were in regular contact in those years and afterward, uh, that either the world of truth would destroy the world of lies or the organized lying would destroy the world of truth. The process proved very difficult for the retrograde elements in the Soviet Union to control. The world of truthfulness expanded exponentially Gorbachev was in a position where, in order to suppress the new world that was coming into being, he would have had to discredit himself. And so a mechanism was created in which, in fact, the, the, the cementing factor in the country, which was the ideology, became progressively discredited. People learned about, for example, the Ukrainian famine, in which three million people were sentenced to death in order to create the collective farm system. They learned about the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the secret protocols that integrated the Baltic Republic, that, 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 that made it possible for the uh, Soviet Union to take over the, ba the Baltic Republics and so on. Previously, every national culture had been depicted as striving toward its culmination in the creation of a socialist state. Suddenly, once people had truthful information, they realized that the national culture had nothing to do with the socialist state. And the, the force of nationalism became overpowering and was one of the most important, probably uh, maybe the most important factor in the breakup of the Soviet Union. Under those circumstances, the Soviet Union split along national lines and the constituent republics, including Ukraine, voted uh, for independence. And what's significant in the case of Ukraine is that the vote for independence, which was 90% in favor, 
included the Russian-speaking regions. It included all of the regions that Russia was later to invade, including Crimea, where there was a large Russian, retired Russian military presence. After the Soviet Union broke up, along the lines of the republics that formed it in 1923, the uh, various countries entered into treaties with each other. In 2000, uh, well, in the case, there, there have been roughly 250 treaties, including a treaty of friendship and cooperation signed in 1997, between Russia and Ukraine, all of which uh, recognize Ukraine in its existing boundaries, including Crimea. The, uh, in, in 2002, at a joint press conference between Putin, after Putin had become president, and Leonid Kravchuk, who was the president of Ukraine, Putin not only uh, acknowledged, of course, the independence of Ukraine, which was taken for granted, but said that he had no objections even to Ukraine joining NATO. He said, on the contrary, Ukraine is an independent country. It has, a, uh, uh, just as Russia is, and that, that he spoke truthfully, it has a right to join NATO just as any other country has that right. And Similar statements and similar actions characterized Russian and Ukrainian uh, relations up until 2013, when the Euromaidan revolt broke out in Ukraine and mass self organizing democratic uh, uh, demonstrations against the kleptocratic rule in Ukraine succeeded, first of all, in unsettling the regime and eventually overthrowing it and replacing it with a, with a leadership that was pro-Western, that wanted to join the European Union and was hopeful about joining NATO. It was only then that all previous statements, all previous commitments were, were uh, ignored, and Russia began a massive propaganda campaign about supposed Nazis in Ukraine, and was, of course, as we know, uh, to use that as the basis for justifying their aggression. So why is it, we might ask, that with such a history and such a clear legal situation, Russia took it upon itself uh, to attack a country which in no way threatened it and with which uh, many Russians have family and personal ties. Well, the answer to that goes back to the essence of the Russian regime. What happened after the fall of the... Now, as some of you who remember life in... or either remember or have heard about life in Hungary under the communist regime are aware that a communist regime is based on what are called class values. Communists reject right and wrong as it's understood by the Judeo-Christian tradition. I hope this is not a surprise to most of you. Uh, instead, right and wrong is determined by the interests of the dominant social class, which is considered to be kind of the protagonist of history. This is, needless to say, a device for destroying all moral criteria. And, uh, yeah, all right. the, um, and, uh, the, um, and this was the case in the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union fell, what was essential was to replace that moral framework and to create the basis of, of rule by law, which of course reflects universal values because the equality of the individual before, before the law mirrors the equality of uh, the um, 
believer or the human being before God. That didn't happen. On the contrary, the inheritance, the communist ideological inheritance was carried over into the new, into the new period. And uh, what became essential from the point of view of those who called themselves young reformers was to transform the economic system, regardless of whether there was a framework of legality in which that transformation should take place. The, um, the result, of course, was a criminal takeover of the country. Russia was a country in which the, the property that had been created by the common efforts of the entire population uh, was uh, distributed on the basis of criminal ties. And those who acquired that property, not through their own efforts, but through their connections and their ability to pay bribes, basically uh, stripped the assets uh, of that, that property and plunged the country into an economic crisis that was practically unprecedented. National income fell by 50%. And that didn't happen even under German, even under Nazi occupation. Uh, the, the, the death rate in Russia reached a level that was, had not been, was only equal to African countries in the middle of civil war. It had never been seen in an industrial country in peacetime. Demographers have a, uh, a measure which they call surplus deaths. You may know it. What it means is the number of people who have died uh, more than could be expected under uh, uh, through the projection of existing trends. In Russia during the 1990s, that figure was 6 million. So it was clear that Yeltsin, who was the president at that time, had no hope of re-election. And in fact, he was well aware that he had no hope. Public opinion polls showed that his approval rating was 2%. He chose an unknown head of the FSB, which is the intelligence service, as his successor, a guy named Vladimir Putin. No one had ever heard of this guy, and his approval rating was 2%. But yet Yeltsin was sure that Putin would become the next president, and he had reasons for that. Uh, the, um, on s August 30th, a, a building was blown up in Buinovsk a city in Dagestan. And then apartment buildings began to be blown up in Russia, in Moscow, and in other cities. The country was panicked into, another, into a second war against the breakaway region of Chechnya. And Putin, who, you know, who was completely lacking in charisma and even was unknown to most Russians, suddenly was on television constantly as the leader of the effort to avenge the cruel terrorist acts that had been committed against the Russian population. And he was elected president on that basis. And everything would have been fine, except uh, a fifth bomb was found in a building in Ryazan. And that building and that bomb was... Uh, the people who placed it were arrested. They turned out not to be Chechen terrorists, but agents of the FSB. The evidence is overwhelming and incontrovertible that Putin came to power through an act of terror against his own people and has lived in fear of his own people ever since. It was the greatest mistake of American foreign policy in my view, in the last 30 years, that the Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, declined it, while being questioned in the, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee by Jesse Helms, the chairman, uh, that uh, uh, declined to answer his direct question, if, are the che he, Chechens responsible for what happened? Do you have any evidence to that? She said no, but then the, she declined to answer when he said, well, if the Chechens were not responsible, who was responsible? And her answer was, 
We are opposed to terrorist acts in all their forms. It was, in fact, a non-answer. And it helped to bury the truth about Putin and the truth about his intentions. Under these circumstances, uh, a technique had been developed. Distract the attention of the population uh, from the crimes that are committed by the leadership, direct it toward a foreign enemy, and consolidate power. And that's exactly what happened in the case of the Russian-Ukrainian war. The, um, the seizure of Crimea in 2014 gave a boost to Putin's popularity, which at one time this guy had a 2% popularity rating. After the seizure of Crimea, his popularity rating was 90%. But the effect, the Crimea effect began to wear off. The contradictions in the Russian system be became more and more serious. And the United States demonstrated by abandoning its ally in Afghanistan that it did not have the will to resist. And that set the stage for the present war. Now, we know uh, that Putin was expecting an easy victory. The Russian regime always expects an easy victory. They expected an easy victory in Chechnya. Historically, they expected an easy victory in the Russo-Japanese War. They expected an easy victory in the Russo-Finnish War. They even underestimated Hitler and the Wehrmacht. So there's nothing unusual about that. Um, they also began throwing in uh, untrained troops uh, in what amounted to a mass slaughter. We, I've been in touch with people in Russia. I can tell you that in some cases, the amount of time that elapses between the moment a Russian gets what's called a pavestka, a, a, call, a, call, a call to report for military service from civilian life, to the time it goes, go to, and goes through training, gets to the battlefield, and comes back in a zinc coffin is less than five weeks. In the meantime, they are showering people with money in areas outside of Russia. And the things that are, ha that it, and that has to a great extent, that plus the nonstop and deafening propaganda has had the effect of stifling any discontent. Uh, people oftentimes, and it's a terrible testimony to what's going on there, are more concerned about the money they get for a dead, a dead relative than they are about the relative himself. In fact, there was one uh, ad on Russian television that could only appear in Russia, in which they show, uh, so, uh, you know, a, a, a mother and father being paid for their for the death of their son. And they explain that they're going to buy a car with the money, and the first thing they're going to do is go to the cemetery to visit his grave. Well, what now we are in a situation in which many people, initially, of course, there was a great deal of support for Ukraine because of the obvious spect you know, the, uh, the obvious aggression to which it has been subjected. But increasingly, people are saying, well, is this worth our money? What about the risk? You know, is this to our advantage? And so on. Maybe we should freeze the, 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 the war now and quote unquote save lives. Well, that statement is itself disingenuous and dishonest because every war ends with a ceasefire and an agreement of some sort, either a ceasefire or an, or an agreement or both. The question is, uh, when and how? Would a ceasefire that left Russia with 20% of Ukrainian territory in effect gave them the victory and rewarded their aggression, 
result in peace? I'm sorry to say it would not. The, what is happening during these years of war, Russia has been completely reorganized in terms of its propaganda inside the country, in terms of the political system, in terms of the, the economy, and the populations, the, the regime's objectives and the population's expectations have not changed. Ukraine at the same time is unwilling to accept a situation in which, having suffered so grievous, grievously, their territory is, is, is taken over, and those under occupation are subjected to the same kind of barbarity, that, uh, which differs, as I say, only in degree from what we have seen in the Middle East, in Israel. I was in Bucha, where the, where the, you know, the, where the, it's, a, it's just a, a very pleasant uh, kind of resort town outside of Kiev, where the population was massacred by the occupying Russians. There, both sides, both Ukrainians and Russians, have a tradition of partisan warfare. Uh, uh, anything but the complete defeat of Russia will immediately be followed by partisan warfare and a renewal of the hostilities at the first opportunity. The, Ru the Russians' word in this respect is worth nothing. In the first Chechen war, the um, uh, Russians signed a peace treaty with Chechnya in 1997 in which they promised that all further questions between Russia and the Chechen Republic, which they recognized as an object of international, an object of international relations, will, will, be, will be settled uh, by uh, peaceful means. Well, they found a way around that. They just blew up the apartment buildings and said that was the Chechens who did it. And they attacked again. The other question is, what about the West, including Hungary and the NATO alliance and the US? There's, been a, there's a tr tremendous flood of disinformation about the cost of what's happening, as if cost was an issue when people are dying, in effect, for our values. But the, but the, 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 the reality is that uh, if we, if, if this war is renewed, Ukraine, having suffered grievous losses, uh, might very well not be able to resist Russian aggression. And the next step would be the countries that are in NATO. They, the, the, the Russians have no problem inventing pretexts. And in fact, their Russian military doctrine pledges them to uh, defend Russian speakers wherever they may be. Well, there are plenty of Russian speakers in Estonia and Latvia. There may be some here, for all I know. The, um, the solidarity, the war is a test of will, always. You're not defeated until you admit defeat. The uh, Ukrainians are unwilling to admit defeat. If at some point they decide they cannot go on because of the terrible casualties they're taking, that's a decision for them to make, not for the people who are supplying them with, ne with arms that they need to defend themselves and their national integrity. If we don't recognize that responsibility, there are all kinds of places in the world in which uh, our resolve will be tested anew, including in the Far East and in the Middle East. Uh, countries, leaders of criminal states watch the behavior of the United States. They watch the behavior of the NATO alliance. The best thing that the United States can do in this situation is to demonstrate that it will stand by its allies. The best thing that the members of the NATO alliance can do 
is to show they will stand by the United States. The one thing I do not advise any small nation to do is one, interfere in some way in the internal politics of the US by taking one side or another. And second, undermining the common defense. That applies to everyone. I hope that, um, the, and I hope and I believe that the shock of what happened in Israel will also enlighten people all over the world that there are dangers that only you know, decent values and countries that are de based on decent values uh, can defend against. We don't want a world run according to Russian or Chinese or Hamas or Iranian values. But unfortunately, that ca we can't be sure of it unless we're willing to defend what we have. In any case, uh, we'll have more time to talk about this. Uh, I can provide, and, and I'll be happy to provide more in the way of historical background because there's a lot more to say, but thank you again for being here. Yeah. Thank you, David, and please join us here on the panel. Uh, I would like to, before I give the, uh, the floor to Attila, to uh, give an opportunity to our guests who are standing in the back. If they want to sit down, I think this is a good opportunity. You can come forward. We still have some seats, so you're more than welcome to, to sit down. Um, if, if, you, if you want to, of course, you're welcome to stand as well. And uh, this actually uh, is, is true for Attila as well. So you can stand there if you would like, but you can also sit down, whatever is more comfortable to you. Please uh, give us your, your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to stay put. So I'm going to sit. Um, so uh, I almost completely agree with the historical background that was uh, given to us. I think it was it was really a deep and uh, and very sound assessment of how this war started uh, and some of the reasons of this war and and I absolutely agree about the nature of the Russian regime. So uh, what was said about the Russian word, I agree that you cannot trust uh, the word of Russia um, and. Um, and uh, it's a, it would be a mistake to believe anything what is coming out of the Kremlin. Um, uh, still, I, I would like to say a few words about history, because nationalism was not only the doom of uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the issue of uh, minorities and oppressed nations, but unfortunately, it's an issue in Ukraine too. And it's always missed by the Western audience. So Ukraine was not a one uh, nation country after it was, it became independent more than 30 years ago. There were several nations were in Ukraine, in Crimean Tatars, uh, Russians, Hungarians, Romanians, Poles, and others, Bulgarians. Um, and um, and uh, the war in Ukraine is not and I, I know very well that uh, that many say it's Russian propaganda. The war in Ukraine is not only about only about Russia. Uh, there was an internal conflict uh, uh, based on language, how to approach uh, minorities, how to approach different cultures. And I think in that uh, uh, that Ukraine made a mistake after 2014. It's very important to point out. I was there when, before the Russians invaded, uh, because the first invasion started in 2014. This war did not start in 2022. This war became even more outrageous in 2022, but uh, the Russian invasion started in, in 2014. But even before that started, one of the main uh, demands on Maidan was the end of the, the quite liberal and tolerant language law. Uh, in 2012, and I was there at the first meeting of the Hungarian Minister of Defense and the Ukrainian Minister of Defense at NATO HQ in Brussels when we asked one thing of the Ukrainians, and many other countries asked this, don't touch uh, these laws because these are very tricky issues. But to go back when the vote was on Ukraine, 
Yes, uh, the Crimeans voted uh, to become independent. Hungarians voted to become independent, but they also voted to have an autonomy uh, within Ukraine. And I know, I know very well it's, uh, it's absolutely not a question today in, in, in Ukraine. It's, it's going to ever happen. But still, this was the start of Ukraine. And for us, um, this is an issue which, uh, which is very unfortunate, what happened, uh, happened after 2014, that the more liberal and tolerant Ukraine was the pre-2014 uh, Ukraine in a sense of national minorities. And this is a Hungarian peculiarity, but I'm not going to speak about 100 years of Hungarian history, but for us, schools, language, national symbols, cemeteries are very important, and all of these were under one or other type of attack in Ukraine after 2014. I have to say that, and, I'm, and I know that I'm going to be very unpopular with many people, but this is what is in my heart. I traveled to Ukraine since 1993, and I know what is Ukraine going through, but it, it's an enormous mistake by Ukraine, uh, and not only via Hungary, not vis-a-vis -vis Hungary, but also Romanians are very upset. And if you look at what happened in the last few days, Romania is offering a lot, but Ukraine also was also told that Romania is not satisfied with the current laws. And now even the EU is saying. So it's a very important point. We cannot miss uh, on the Hungarian position that it's a deeply felt issue. Uh, about, uh, but it's of course not as important than, than winning the war. I, 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 I acknowledge that. Uh, still, it's a question why Ukraine is so adamant on keeping on the EU nations such rules that even a Christmas song must be translated or you get fines. But going back to the big picture, because this is, I absolutely know that this is a very small part of the big picture and not the most important part. The big picture is that yes, Ukraine uh, needs to win uh, the war. It's not a question. And I completely agree with that. But we have to ask what is victory? Because I think Ukraine won this war in the first two weeks, uh, in a sense that Ukraine will never be like Belarus. There is no scenario, no Russian military victory, which can bring Ukraine to be Belarus. Why? Because even those in Ukraine who were open to Russia. Even the Russians, many of the Russian speakers are now against Russia. And the Western Ukrainians were always against Russia. Russia is a country of 150 million. It cannot keep a country of about 30 million, because that's the reality about Ukrainian uh, numbers today, under its boot. You need million, you would need millions of people to occupy Ukraine. Belarus, you don't need, because you have a regime there that uh, serves Russian interest. It was a failure in the first two weeks to establish a puppet regime in Ukraine, but I, I believe that even if Russia wins militarily, it would have lost the guerrilla war in the west of Ukraine. There would be a terrible guerrilla war on Russia, and they would, uh, they would have lost it. Uh, in one year or two, it doesn't matter. Russia cannot control Ukraine, let alone NATO countries. Russia is simply not such a strong country. It's proving it every day. So what, uh, what is the question? Will Ukraine win? In that sense, Ukraine had already won, and Ukraine cannot lose because Russia simply is not strong enough uh, to keep all of Ukraine under its boot. It would be a truly underestim true underestimation of the Ukrainian nation and Ukrainian nationalism, because this is a nationalist, also a nationalist war against uh, hundreds of years of Russification, uh, to underestimate the Ukrainians to think that Russia can win in that sense. Russia would lose mightily if it tries to occupy Western Ukraine. Russia have a little chance in places where there is some support for Russia. And I traveled quite a lot on the east of Ukraine and the south Ukraine. Uh, in Crimea and in the Donbas, there is support for Russia. If, if we don't see that, then we don't understand the, the, the situation. It's not just, uh, just uh, made, up, made up by Russian propaganda. So um, uh, what is about winning in a way that uh, Russia uh, is totally defeated? So Russia is uh, pushed out of Ukraine, including Crimea, because this is what uh, President Zelensky says, and I completely agree. I would say the same if I am the president of Ukraine and if I'm a Ukrainian, but I'm not a Ukrainian, I'm an analyst. Uh, and, um, and an analyst who deals with geopolitics and military issues for 25 years, I just don't see 
how Ukraine, even with the unconditional and unlimited Western help, can do that? That's the big question. As I said, Ukraine already won, in a sense that it will never be like Belarus. But can Ukraine win? And this is the big question. Can Ukraine win in a sense that all Russian troops leave Ukraine in defeat? Maybe it can, but after Russia is broken internally. But it's not going to happen by, uh, by military means. Uh, it, it needs an internal break within Russia, like if Prigozhin is a bit more cunning or if there is more inside uh, support for Prigozhin, but it didn't happen. So there, I think there was one shot within the next few years that, that the Russian regime breaks. Otherwise, the numbers are not looking good. Um, and um, my sources uh, are, are from Ukraine. So these are, uh, these are, uh, these are Ukrainian sources I'm quoting. Russia is losing a lot of people in some mindless attacks and some not so mindless attacks. So Russians are not always losing. This is our narrative in the West. Uh, we always see the Russian tanks blowing up. We don't see the Ukrainian tanks blowing up. Why? Because the Ukrainians are much more clever of hiding their uh, losses. They are not putting it on uh, Instagram or Vkontakte. Uh, the real, real uh, casualty ratio is very close to one to one. It's not five to one. It's not seven to one. You need five to one uh, for uh, for Ukraine to win, and it's not five to one. I can tell you, what is Russia is losing, and I agree with the terrible uh, treatment of Russian uh, soldiers. But most of this terrible treatment was meted out on the Stormzy uh, groups, which are basically prisoners, prisoners, and also on, on Wagner. So that that happened. And these loss ratios were true for some battles in Bakhmut region, but generally it's not true. We, don't, we just don't see the suffering of, of uh, Ukraine, which is enormous. And also I, have, I see a full Ukrainian mobilization now, and I don't see a full Russian mobilization. It's a partial Russian mobilization. If you look at the numbers on the front lines, actually they are even or there are less Russians on the front line. What does it mean? It means that uh, Russia is keeping most of its core Russian population, ethnic Russians, uh, out of the war. So who, who are they sending? The Russians are extremely cynical, and I completely agree with most of your assessment how the, how the Putin regime is and how it was born. I agree that it was a false flag uh, operation, um, yeah, uh, which started the Chechen war. So I don't have any doubts on the nature of the Russian regime, but they are not stupid. The problem is that uh, we look at Russia as simply stupid people. They are not stupid. Not only their propaganda is quite, uh, quite effective, uh, but also how they use their assets. Uh, it's not so, not so, it, not so. Mm, it's it's not unwise because what they do, they use minorities, they use prisoners. They use poor, poor, poor people, and they don't use the middle class intelligentsia of Moscow and St. Petersburg and the, and the Russian majority areas. So Russia still have a steam in it, uh, while Ukraine steam, you know, Ukraine is started this war with 37 million people. That was a Ukrainian internal count of the population. Uh, maybe 35, there are, uh, I, I, I got it from Ukraine, these two data. Um, some somewhere in that ballpark. So it's very, uh, very probable that Ukraine is under 30 million people now, and Ukraine lost more than 100,000 dead and uh, and a lot more uh, wounded. Uh, Russia is, I, th I think, it's in the similar, maybe more, but not uh, two or three times more dead and wounded. So what is the what is the end game? Uh, the end game is uh, would have been for Ukraine to be much more efficient than Russia and to have not uh, uh, to have uh, military operations which consist of breakthroughs and circumvents and destruction of the Russian army in Zaporizhia that was the hope of Ukraine did it happen during this uh, four, four months offensive it, it didn't happen uh, it, I'm not saying it's a failure but it's definitely not a victory it's definitely not a victory uh, will it happen in the future? That's the question. 
Uh, the main question is, can we provide enough arms? I think there is only one country which can provide enough arms. That's called the United States of America. And the United States did not provide everything it could. And I think it has its reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is what we see now in Israel, that the United States is a global power with global responsibilities. And there are many other uh, crisis regions uh, where for, for what the uh, United States is keeping the gunpowder. So for me, the big question is, can we, the West, can the United States defeat Russia militarily? Can, uh, can, is it possible with even giving everything, maybe? Will the US give everything? Meaning hundreds and hundreds of Abrams, not 31. A thousand Bradleys, not a few hundred. It's not, it's not happening. If there was a chance, and then, I'm sorry for being so honest, for Ukraine to win, that was last autumn, uh, when Russia was really underestimating Ukraine. Russian hubris almost defeated itself, Russia, and I completely agree that they approach things with hubris, but now they don't have this hubris. Look at the lines they are making, the millions of mines they are, uh, they are using. So this Russian hubris is over. It wasn't used by the West, this opportunity to break uh, Russia. There was something given to Ukraine, extremely important intelligence help was given, but not enough weapons. Now, the Russians are not under, underestimating Ukraine anymore. So that momentum was lost. So now what will happen? There is only one way for full victory, in a sense, what President Zelensky describes as victory, is for Russia to break from the inside. Uh, economically, politically, I don't see it happening. Maybe it's gonna happen, but to count on this, is to count on a very, very small chance. And I'm sorry to be so bleak. Uh, it's not something I'm happy to, to say, and it's not something what I said now. I said it uh, after the offensive, uh, and I wrote it, that it's, if, it, if there is no victory, then it's very unlikely to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attila, for uh, the very realistic uh and perhaps a bit bleak Hungarian perspective. Uh, I will now give the chance for Stephen to give his uh, remarks, please. Yes. Just steal your microphone and switch with that one. Um, yeah, sobering indeed. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say, David, it's an honor to share a panel with you since I've been such a great fan of the Age of Delirium uh, for many years now. And I did, by the way, a few days ago in preparation for this, go back and reread the chapter on Ukraine at the end of the book. And you know, I had read the Robert Conquest book at Harvest of Sorrow back in the 80s and had to keep putting it down, it's so grim. And you made reference to it tonight. You, that chapter includes not only the history of the transition out of Soviet domination in the 90s, but also includes uh, uh, some details of that horrific Russian-imposed offensive against the Ukrainian people. That's putting it mildly. And it also occurred to me that was 1933, so 90 years ago. I suspect there's still a handful of people still alive with a first-hand recollection of that. And, and uh, you know, Attila, you mentioned history. You know, the, the great American Southern writer, William Faulkner, how did that go? That, you know, the past, uh, there isn't history, the past isn't even past. It's still very much with us. And you made reference the to some of the... In fact, it isn't even bad. That's it, thank you. I knew I didn't have it right, but uh, right. Uh, and and uh, so, Attila, you mentioned some of the lingering cultural clashes and uh, you know, uh, linguistic things that Americans don't really understand, except maybe in the most distant way with some of our arguments over bilingual education and our large Hispanic-speaking population. Okay. Uh, so, David, I think to the subject at hand, I. I I think I'm in complete agreement with you that it's in our interest and everyone's interest for Ukraine to win. And there are varying levels of what that interest may be. And I do think I should uh, uh, press you a little bit on a couple of aspects of your argument that I think need to be drawn out further. So I'll give you first a general question mm -hmm. from the American point of view, and then two or three more specific ones to deal with. The first one is, uh, if you talk to the everyday American, the person who doesn't know Ukraine from Uruguay. And, and as you know, and I think uh, people who pay attention to the United States, which I know as many of you do, you know, we're going through a moment where we're reverting to, uh, to put it in the best form, the old John Quincy Adams attitude. 
You know, our John Quincy Adams said uh, in, what, 1825, whatever it was, uh, the United States of America is a friend of liberty everywhere, but a defender only of our own. And so that everyday American says, yeah, we don't like the Russians. You know, we've had the long Cold War and hated them and so forth and know they're bad people. But what is the interest of Ukraine to the United States that compels us or uh, to want to go in with a significant commitment? So now I'll ask you a little bit about the level of that commitment. And also, Attila makes the point of, I'll rephrase it, Attila, why has the United States been so halting and hesitant in the military equipment that is supplied. This has bothered me a lot too. Uh, so David, I, I, um, I, I, first of all, our president was supposed to give a speech about finally about what our Ukraine strategy or policy is. I don't know if I've missed it. I think it's been put off because of current events. Maybe that silence is prudent. Maybe you don't want the American president to go out making any firm declarations about uh, because we want to leave latitude for the Ukrainians, above all, since they're our ally in the matter. Uh, but as I watch our actions, I keep being drawn back to the Vietnam War when we did not have the will to win. Talk about wars being a contest of will. We, we uh, conceived it as a social science exercise with graduated pressure where, you know, if we just keep upping our troop level and our bombing levels, that will compel the North Vietnamese to understand the conflict the way we want it to be understood and negotiate a settlement. They never had any interest in that idea at all. And that agony went on for a long time. And so I watched in the beginning where we will send some arms to Ukraine and then the Ukrainians will request or our strategists will recommend, well, they ought to have high Mars missile systems, and we say, no, you shouldn't have those. Well, okay, we'll send you those. Uh, M16 tanks, no, we don't want to send the, uh, sorry, the M1 Abrams tanks, we don't want to send those, and then we change our mind and do that. No, we don't think you need F16 fighters, and then six months later we decide to do that. Then here a few months ago, seemingly out of nowhere, probably not, but the news was sh startling, cluster bombs, which of course the international community frowns upon, uh, you know, very effective and deadly weapons. And so I'm watching all this and I'm wondering, perfectly reasonable to worry that uh, Vladimir Putin might resort to nuclear weapons. Totally reasonable thing to worry about. On the other hand, it seems to me if our view early on was this, uh, Russia needs to be defeated, it seems to me we'd be better off saying, what do they need to win? and making a firm commitment to supply what is necessary to win. Now maybe, that, maybe that's a technical question. You know, M1 tanks, you have to be trained on those. Same with F-16 fighters and all the rest. And so maybe you couldn't absorb a flood of advanced weapons. I don't know those things. That's above my pay grade. Uh, but I worry that, and I think if you're Hungary or any other countries in the region, you worry for a reason that you mentioned, our withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, you worry, are we gonna see it through? Or is this another example of when America is going to lose heart, as we've done before, because we don't like long, drawn-out conflicts. This one right now is only costing us money and weapons, and it seems unlikely we'd ever send any troops, any large numbers to participate, but who knows? Uh, uh, so, all right, so there's that question about what do you make of... Actually, I wrote it down here because you were saying it, you both said sure. it's up to us. What should the United States do? And then finally, the last question, and uh, you can take this up if you want, it's just one that um, it's on my mind a lot, is, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the old supposed Mark Twain line, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Uh, so one of the far too facile comparisons as well, you know, those regions of Eastern Ukraine where there are a certain amount of Russian speakers who may have ambivalent loyalties, that looks like the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia in 1938, right? And the, the logic of appeasement, you didn't use those words, David, but the logic of appeasement was, I think you came close to it, though, in saying that, look, if the Russia gets away with this, who's next? That's, that's been the lesson we've taken from appeasement. By the way, it's why Lyndon Johnson said, I can't, with, I can't stop our commitment to Vietnam because it would be appeasement all over again, and didn't we learn our lesson once? I'm not certain that logic is still as compelling today. I think you're right about the character of Russia. The logic of their, uh, it's absolutely right about them, but I also think that uh, you look at the way Poland is arming very vigorously, I think a wake up call to NATO, even the uncertainty of the United States, I'm not sure a, a, a Russia that's now been degraded to the extent it has is really capable in the way the German army was off of those successive concessions in the 30s. 
uh, so I'm not, I don't disagree with you about your assessment of Russia and what they would do if they had a free hand. Maybe the Baltics are uh, vulnerable. That, you, that would be easy to overrun those countries, I think. And maybe we should worry about that more. But I think that uh, at the very least, we're degrading Russia with our level of support. I have to say the cynic in me thinks that the American policy, unstated may be, we will fight to the last Ukrainian. I'm not very happy about that. Um, but the idea is we will degrade the Russian military capacity at low risk to us and low risk of a nuclear war. And these are things I worry about. I don't have firm conclusions about them, but I think they're questions that need to be pressed on everyone. So, thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I think you're trying to steal my job as moderator <laughs> with, with all the questions. Uh, but I will now uh, allow um, David to make, you know, <laughs> some of his remarks on Attila's speech, but also perhaps on some of the questions. Yeah, can I make it from there, but so I get to look at everyone? Sure. Of course, right. uh, of course. Is that right? But please uh, keep, just... keep it a short because oh. we still have a lot of questions. I and I want a microphone. To... No. Wait, David, take a microphone yeah. with you. I, I need a microphone. Yeah. I will keep it short, even though those are very good questions. Very good questions. In fact, Steve, I. Those are, I, I hope I don't forget all your questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm in the process. Hold on. How do we do this? I need some technical advice. Um, okay. Uh, there's, 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 a, a, you know, the, there's a lot here to respond to. The most important question, of course, is the one that I think Steve posed. Uh, why is this important to the United States? What does it really matter? Uh, let's say the Russians occupy part of Ukraine. Let's say they carry out atrocities there. Uh, what's, the, what's the point? I mean, nobody in the US is going to be affected, or at least not very many people. The problem is that the United States uh, and the world depend on a few fundamental principles of international order. And of those, the most important is respect for territorial integrity. If Russia is able simply to seize a sovereign state, uh, a fundamental principle underlying world peace has been sacrificed. And it will be impossible to organize resistance on that basis in the future. That's why, that's what we're defending, what's, that's what the Ukrainians are defending on our behalf. And that's why they're worthy of support. On the subject of the aid to Ukraine and why we didn't give them more, I have to say that I'm a su pleasantly surprised to the point of almost being astounded that President Biden has done as well as he has done. This is a person who was adamant about not supplying Ukraine uh, with a Javelin anti-tank missiles during the Obama administration. But for whatever reason, he has accepted qualified military advice. The reason why uh, the, the support has not been more fulsome, has not been more expansive and uh, more uh, timely is because of the internal pressures both within the administration and within the country. Uh, I certainly hope that those are being overcome and that, in fact, Ukraine will get what it needs. On the subject of what is the strategy, there is no American strategy, and it's a ridiculous question. There's a Ukrainian strategy. You, our strategy is to support Ukraine in every way we can. They're the ones. They're the ones who are losing lives. They're the ones who have to decide what they can accept, what they can't accept. Uh, no American lives are being lost, no NATO lives are being lost. Uh, and that means that that decision has to be made by them 
and no one is in a better position to make it. On the subject of the, which, which, which Attila has, point, has raised and is very valid, I think, about military progress, um, the truth is we don't know. No one predicted the Prigozhin revolt uh, a week before it happened. And he and, he and, and 4,000 other members of the Wagner unit traveled 500 miles in one day and came to within 120 miles of Moscow. You know, uh, Bismarck had a saying about Russia. He said, there are two things we can never know, what the weather is going to be tomorrow and what's going to happen in Russia. <laughs> and uh, it's still true. It's still true. He had another remark. He said, Russia is never as strong as it seems and never as weak as it seems. We will, uh, can Ukraine prevail? It can. Doesn't mean it will. But the, one of the most important factors in this whole situation is the, the I, I, it was Napoleon who said that in the, we're getting into a lot of quotes here, but I hope you all appreciate this, um, that in war, the, the spiritual factor versus the material factor is as three to one. And the Ukrainians have the spirit. Do the Russians? Well, a series of things have happened that if they're capable of thinking at all, will totally demoralize them, including the Prigozhin revolt and the blowing up of, of Prigozhin's airplane. Because remember that the Wagner group was the most effective fighting force uh, in, in the Russian army. Now they're being integrated theoretically into other units. How will that affect both the other units and the Wagner fighters themselves? We don't know. If you, Ukraine wins, it's going to win because there's going to be a sudden breakthrough in the front. Remember, this is stationary war. Uh, the, you know, the positions are stationary. The, uh, if, if they break through those lines, uh, you know, they can make progress very, very rapidly. And they've had some, some successes. But the other factor is we don't know what the morale is of the, on the Russian side. We have fragmentary information that suggests it's not good and that, they, that, that, they, that Russians correctly assume they're being thrown into a meat grinder. Should they stop and just admit defeat? Uh, I think that's a decision that only the Ukrainians can make. We haven't... We haven't endured what they've had to endure, and we will not face the consequences as they will. But by standing firm in Ukraine, we're also sending a message. I have friends in, in they've just gotten back from Korea and, to, and Tokyo, uh, and, and ta Taiwan, who, who emphasize the importance of showing support for Ukraine as a signal to China and to Iran. So, I mean, Steve, did I miss something? No. Attila, did I miss? All right. Now, I think at this point, maybe we'll ask the audience. Thank you, David. Yeah. I have some questions yeah, as well, ahead. but uh, uh, actually, I want to ask all of you so you can sit yeah. down, but I, it's, it's up to you. Yeah. So, uh, first, uh, well, I think I be a bit provocative sometimes, perhaps, but uh, forgive me, I'm a, I'm a Hungarian. <laughs> um, so first, we talk, I mean, the whole title of the, of the talk is, uh, you know, Ukraine needs to win. Uh, and we did talk about that, that it needs to win. I think all three of you agreed that Ukraine has to win. But I'm not sure I know what winning is in this, uh, in this regard. And, um, and, you know, also, I mean, we're hearing all these stories, and, and I'm not an expert on Russia or Ukraine, Mm -hmm. uh, not even Eastern Europe. I'm just a Hungarian. That's my only, <laughs> uh, you know, kind well, of. Well, that makes you an expert. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my only skin in the game, uh, and I know history, especially the Hungarian. Uh, but you know, you hear all these views. You know, on the one hand, you hear that, you know, you have to support Ukraine now because Russia is weak. So if you give just a bit more support, then Russia will crumble, and then and then Ukraine can win. 
Uh, but on the other hand, uh, and I think David, you were uh, hinting a bit that as well, and some of our American friends uh, are saying that that uh, you know. Russia is very strong, it will win, and you know, once Ukraine is over, Hungary, the Baltics, and others are next. And for me, these two things just don't really come together. So I don't, I mean, and, and even if, let's say, Russia can uh, get away with what they have now and gets parts of East, Eastern Ukraine, keeps the Crimea, and I understand that, you know, it's, it's an industry, uh, industrial part of, of Ukraine and you know, gets, gets some territory and it could become stronger, or, you know, you have a scenario he would perhaps occupy the whole of Ukraine, and of course, that manpower and industry would help their war effort. But I'm kind of leaning with Attila here, that first, I don't think Russia can really do that. And even if, you know, as a miracle could, uh, I don't think they, I mean, keeping Ukraine would keep them occupied for years. And I just don't think that Russia is going to be a global superpower in the next 20, 30 years, because they, I mean, if they look at their demographics, their, uh, their industry, I just, as a Hungarian, honestly, I'm, I'm much less afraid of Russia, even though it's in the neighborhood, than, let's say, China. Uh, so, uh, or, or potentially India, of course, that's a you know, fairly friendly state. Uh, but I think that these countries have much more potential to be global powers than, let's say, Russia. But going back, this is more of a side note, but I'm, of course I'm interested in what you see on this. But what would be a win, really, for Ukraine? So, do we, you know, think, I mean, you could argue, I mean, I know most people will not like it, that Ukraine already win, as Otila was hinting, because they haven't been occupied. So even, even as a ceasefire tomorrow, Ukraine is still a free country. Uh, so what is a win? Do they, do they get well, back? Well, part of you, part of, a part of Ukraine is not occupied. Part of uh, Ukraine is Okay. True, but I mean, what is, what is, I mean, do we want to get back before 2022? Do we want to get back Crimea? And also, the nuclear thing comes here. I personally, I'm afraid if, if uh, I think Eastern Ukraine, Russia might give back. But the Crimea, and as I said, I'm not an expert, but I'm, I'm pretty uh, anxious if we would try to get to the Crimea, then Russians would be, you know, looking at the nuclear option. And, uh, and I personally, I'm a bit afraid of that. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of you know Ukrainians who say so yes. We have to. Base, basically, the question is: on the one hand, is Russia a serious, really a serious threat if they hold on to this territory? Yes. And uh, the other thing is: if if they are challenged, are they likely to use nuclear weapons? Uh, partly yes, but also. In your mind, then I will ask the others as well, what is a win for Ukraine? So what is a, a realistic... There's been, uh, it's fun, there's been no ambiguity about this. Uh, Ukraine has, and, and Vlad, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky has said many times that Ukraine must recover its territory. That's victory. That's what they're fighting for. Now, what would happen in reality if there was a Ukrainian breakthrough and the, the conditions for negotiations changed radically? Let's say that there's a breakthrough and they're able to sever what the Russians call the land bridge. Uh, what's possible then? We don't know. You know, in the Chechen war, what happened was uh, Russia was on the verge of a massive defeat because the Chechen rebels reoccupied Grozny, the capital city, and they had the Russian troops in Grozny surrounded. And the Russians said that they were going to just annihilate them. But uh, uh, and they were, going to, uh, they were going to level the city. They were going to simply raise the entire city. That's what they said. And the, 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 but in the end, they agreed to a complete withdrawal because th the conditions for negotiations had been, ch had been changed. And not only did they withdraw, but they withdrew ahead of time. And they pulled all their troops out of Chechnya, with the idea they'd go back later, of course, but that's, that's another point. Um, the uh, 
Russia in possession of part of Ukraine will interpret this and it will be interpreted by the Russian people as a victory, but a partial victory. That has that ha it, with with the main task still to be accomplished. Uh, Russia is already in the process of converting the entire economy to a wartime basis. Military spending is twice as twice what it was before the beginning of the war, and uh, in in fact, military indoctrination is taking place everywhere. But the most important factor isn't even that. The factor is that the whole psychological uh, 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 disposition of the country has been or is now oriented toward aggression. And if, in fact, they were to engage in another war, say in two or three years' time, uh, given the grievous losses that Ukraine has, has has absorbed, and given the attention span in the West, and given the internal crisis in the United States, uh, they might very well be able to finish the job. And it would be, uh, and with that mentality and that, uh, and that that kind of militarized economy, rem think of what North Korea is able to do without Western technology, with a population of 20 million. Well, imagine Russia with its technological possibilities and its resources and its population. Its ability to th threaten, for example, Estonia, which has a population of one million. And remember, there are Russian cities in Estonia. Narva, right across from Ivanograd, is a Russian city. They, 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 they watch Russian television. They get Russian propaganda. And let's say that then NATO is compelled to defend, or the United States is compelled to defend a vulnerable NATO country. And let's say we lose because they have the strategic advantage there. Then what good are our alliances all over the world? It's not so simple. And. Uh, we are fortunate to have the Ukrainian, uh, 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 the 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 skilled Ukrainian army, and the pop and a country with the dedication of Ukraine, to hold the line for us. And it's very disappointing when I see what's happening in the United States. But I mean, you're everyone in this room. I think is aware that the, the situation in the United States is not good, and and that there's tremendous internal division. But there, we, ought, we ought to be able to unite on this issue uh, because it's, it's really important to every, everyone. The, um, we don't want a country that is so anxious to threaten others with nuclear war uh, to be telling us what we can and cannot do. And you talked about the nuclear threat. Is there a danger that if Ukraine breaks through to Crimea, for example, that Russia will use nuclear weapons. There's a possibility they will. Uh, I don't think they will for, for uh, but, but that possibility will exist any place where Russia is confronted, and not just in Crimea. And in fact, you know, Crimea has been bombarded uh, regularly now by the Ukrainian forces, and we haven't seen a nuclear response. Generally speaking, those nuclear threats uh, are, were well answered by Boris Johnson. He said, I hate to tell you this, but we have nuclear weapons too. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Russians have, you know, I was, I was a correspondent in Moscow in the 1970s, 1980s, and, they, and, and Russian official uh, uh, spokesmen were saying, the smell of nuclear war is in the air. They've been doing this for decades. When, they, when, the first, when we talked about uh, disconnecting Russia from the SWIFT code, and that was before the war began, they said, well, that's nuclear war. But you know, if, they're, you know, uh, if, if all they have to do is threaten nuclear war in order to get what they want, well, you know, they can rule the world. 
So, um, so that's, uh, that's my answer to your questions. I wonder, uh, I suppose we uh, people in the audience also have. I just want to ask Attila and, and Stephen to kind of, you know, because I, my question was for the whole panel. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course. Uh, I think oh. nuclear weapons are unusable, and I think the Russians know that. I, I could be wrong. I, was, I have very hesitant <laughs> to make that kind of general declaration. But, David, uh, you mentioned quite rightly the 70s, the 80s, the Russians would talk tough. But I think we learned later, see if you agree with me about this, we learned yeah. later from you know Soviet documents we got at the end of the Cold War that they had concluded that they couldn't fight a nuclear war. No, they concluded they could. Well, okay. Well, I've heard they, this disputed. They, the Russians believed they could fight and win a nuclear war, but they wanted to be sure. What? Use the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. It's for the video. Is it on? Yeah. They, the Russian, Russian, you know, inside, Russian troops were told that uh, our t our tanks can be in Paris in two weeks. They never said their people, it was always their tanks. Um, their, all of their training was for offensive war. Uh, and uh, their doctrine was that Russia can, can fight and win a nuclear war. Well, I know they had battle but they plans. Didn't, that, that wait, just hang on, Steve. They just, even uh, just made experiments. So they, they sometimes dropped a nuclear bomb and they sent in troops to kind of look at how that affects the troops. So I think they even made a lot of kind of inhuman experiments. They, yeah, but that was in the 50s. Yeah. yeah. The, no, but, but yeah, they did, they did a lot of things like that. But the, but the point is that the deterrence was sufficient to prevent them. But, yeah, I mean, they, they wanted to be, they could fight and win, but the emphasis was on win. They wanted to win. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the balance of forces was never such that they were sure they could win. I think it's the same situation on the Korean Peninsula, by the way. Uh, and that's why, uh, now of course their propaganda was that you know, you're, you're, you're provoking nuclear, every defensive step that we took uh, in order to dissuade them from attacking, they said that that's aggression. But, you know, of course, they, they're, they're using the same tactics now. And they relied on gullible and naive and, and greedy and self-interested people in the West uh, to make that case for them. And there were no shortage of such people. Stephen, you wanted to say anything else? No, to be continued. Yeah. I'll just put it that way. I'm having a running argument with Beth Fisher about this subject. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Beth and her work on this. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Maybe. Yeah, well, you can sh share it here. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> All right. We'll, yeah. well, perhaps uh, Attila can uh, jump uh, in. Ju just a few uh, remarks um, on Russia morale. So actually, I was surprised that, uh, that Russia morale is far better than, than I thought it's going to be. Uh, it's not good. I'm not saying it's good, but it's definitely not zero. If it would be zero, Ukraine would be in Crimea now. Uh, so the VDV groups, uh, VDV uh, uh, brigades, uh, so this is the uh, paratroopers, uh, and some, even some MOBIC units are defending every inch of territory. Um, why? It's a good question. I don't know the answer. I mean, for the VDV groups, yes, because these troops are selected and, and they are not, uh, they're not giving up because of the, the unit morale. But why the Mobics? It's a good question, but still they didn't run away. Um, and uh, I think that be beyond the Russia's breaking inside in Moscow, that was the other hope of Ukrainians before starting the offensive that this Russian morale will break. Um, for me, it's a question if it, it, if it didn't break in more than four months of very heavy fighting, it's gonna break in the future or not. Uh, the Russian future and why Russia is different than Germany. So Nazi Germany was a very, very, very strong power in terms of innovation, in terms of demography, and in terms of uh, military skill. So Germany beyond, before the Second World War uh, could defeat countries which are stronger. France and Britain was stronger than Germany. 
uh, and they still defeated with innovation and with, with skill on the front. Russia is not a country like uh, Germany uh, in 1939. Russia is a country which cannot defeat uh, uh, a country which is five times smaller by population than, than Russia. Uh, and of course, the West, without the Western help, uh, Ukraine would be over by now. That's that's for sure. That Western help saved Ukraine and uh, and the Western arms and in, and intelligence. We always forget this is maybe even more important than arms, especially at the beginning. Uh, intelligence saved uh, Ukraine. Russia is not a country with a great future. It's not a country which is uh, going to to be again uh, on the top of the world. Russian demography is a disaster. Russians are dying out, and I completely agree. The uh, 1990s were really terrible. The 1990s are coming back to Russia. Not Maybe not to that extent, but who will fight for Russia in 15, 20 years? Because those generations who should fight in 20 years should be now uh, one or two years old. Where are they? So I, don't just, I just don't see Russia as a, as a country which is dynamic. Russia, I, I, I thought that Russia will not attack Ukraine because I thought it's irrational. But I also thought, and, uh, and I wrote it, that if Russia does something, Russia will do it in the next few years. I wrote it in 21. Why? Because of demography and because of Putin is getting old. And he, if he wants to be in the history, he will do it, of course, until he's, he's still strong or relatively strong. Both is in decline. Putin is in decline, and Russia is in decline. So, to be very honest, yes, I think we should rearm, and uh, and uh, and some European countries do this rearmament. Hungary is doing this rearmament. We are among those who are spend more than two percent, and we are building uh, some of the uh, most modern forces uh, on, on the NATO's eastern flank. So, actually, only. Of course, Poland is in a different league, but only Poland is ahead of us in terms of heavy equipment, which is coming in now, in terms of how modern it is and how numerous it is. So we should do, all do this. Of course, after 2022, one thing we should learn, finally, never to trust what Russia says. So we should be strong conventionally conventionally strong. Nuclear is there. I mean, uh, I don't think that uh, the US or, uh, would allow. I mean, Britain and France, uh, they don't matter in this because they can be annihilated without uh, much harm to Russia. Um, or, of course, Moscow would go and St. Petersburg, but most of Russia would survive with a nuclear war of, with UK or France. United States is in totally different league, so we need the US <laughs> uh, for nuclear deterrence. So what I would say that Prepare, never trust Russia again. Uh, but to, af to be to afraid of Russia as a dynamic power, I would say that uh, that Russia made the biggest strategic mistake with attacking Ukraine because its power, which is still left, uh, which was uh, generated half stolen because we know that most of some of the funds were stolen, so that's why this uh, uh, military campaign is so weak. The whole system is corrupt. Uh, so this system to revive and be like Germany, the, re the revival of Germany after the defeat in the First World War, I think it's impossible. Uh, as for the question of nuclear, again, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, there, is, there are two different things. Russia would, wouldn't use nuke for, they didn't use nuke for Kherson. They explained that it's a necessary withdrawal. It was humiliation big time for Kharkiv region, and they wouldn't use nuke for Zaporizhia or, or, uh, or the remainder of Kherson. But uh, Crimea, I think it's, a dip I, I'm, I'm not sure that they would, they, they would definitely escalate the war if Crimea is in danger. They wouldn't let it go, why? Because Putin's regime is now have one big goal, to survive. Leave, uh, most Russians don't know what Melitopol is, average Russians. They have no idea what Melit the, of the city of Melitopol. Melitopol fells or Tokmak, they don't understand. They, do, they don't care. Crimea? If Crimea is in danger of uh, falling, that means the fall of Putin. He cannot explain it away. He can explain away everything. He can explain away everything, but not the fall of Crimea. And the fall of Crimea would also mean a million refugees, at least, to Russia. That's, that's not something to hide. Uh, because most Crimeans, 
are not loyal to Ukraine. They were not loyal before the war, and they are not loyal now, and they are afraid of, of Ukraine coming back. Uh, and also, the, all the, the, the pre-2022 part of Donetsk is, is similar. I, I know it from Ukrainian soldiers. I was traveling with them on the Crimean front lines and the Donbas front line before 2022, and that's what they are telling me, that 80% in the Donbas support Russia. Um, and 20% Ukraine. So that's, that's the reality I saw and I heard uh, there. They cannot explain it away. So I think uh, that would be a dangerous moment. I'm not sure that they would use nukes. I'm sure that they would, he would mobilize fully the Russian army and he would use everything uh, he still have. And if it's still falling, then, 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 uh, then even nu nuclear is possible. But one thing about Crimea, one is, thing is not really understood. There are three main entrances to Crimea. The longest entrance is seven kilometers. The others are very, very narrow uh, lanes. It's not very easy to get Crimea. So it's not 1,000 kilometers of front line to defend. It's a few dozen kilometers to defend. So it's a totally different ball game to, to catch to capture Crimea from a military point of view, even if the Crimean bridge is blown up, uh, because it's not such a big area to defend. You can have these raids on Crimea, but, uh, but uh, amphibious landing is, 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 is not a possibility to break through the lines of uh, the defending lines of Crimea. That's also not very easy. So I would say that uh, that's not a very likely scenario that uh, Ukraine can capture Crimea military if Russia defends it. Ukraine can capture Crimea only if the Russian regime is already broken. So if Putin is gone and the Russian regime is broken, then it's, it's possible. But otherwise, it would be a total collapse of Russian military to lose uh, Crimea. Thank you, Attila. My problem is that I'm full of questions, and I will just take just a bit of uh, you know, moderator privileges here to ask one final one, and we can really open it up to the, to the audience. Uh, but I'm, I was kind of intrigued by what you said, David, uh, about you know kind of a miracle Ukrainian counteroffensive which might cut off the Russian forces, and what you know that could be a completely different scenario. And I just wanted to ask, I mean, even in the very beginning, that how do you see? I mean, all of you can of course chime in. Uh, the current counteroffensive. I mean, we heard a lot of things. Uh, it seems it's not as a big success as we were hoping for. It's not, you know, you know, a catastrophe as the Russians were hoping for. It's somewhere in the middle, but it, it's kind of difficult to find uh, honest news about that. So, how successful it is, it? and and also, if let's say it's success, uh, it's successful, and you know, we can cut off it, and let's say the Crimea is threatened. What Otila was saying, and that may also made me thinking that now Putin, in theory, has a very high approval rate. And I hear a lot of stories that even liberal Russians who hated him now kind of say the war is justified. Uh, and what happens, let's say, if what they consider Russian land is threatened, wouldn't that perhaps uh, lend him support? He can mobilize and, uh, you know, this would not actually lead to the uh, dissolution of the Russian regime, but actually strengthen it as a perverse uh, like it, what happened in the Second World War when everybody hated Stalin, but still Germany coming in kind of united all the Russians. And uh, could this lead to that? Or, you know, you think uh, collapse of the regime is, is more likely? And, and also, very provocatively, you don't have to answer, is that really good for us? So let's say the regime collapses in Russia. There could be somebody who is worse than Putin. Or you could have a civil war in a country which has nuclear weapons. And I'm not sure that's really good for us. It's, you know, uh, uh, I know it's a lot of questions. You don't yeah, have to answer all of them. <laughs> it is. On the subject, I will start with the counter offensive. This is a question that's be best answered by military specialists. Uh, and I'm not a military specialist. I can tell you what I've been told, uh, and that is that uh, they have penetrated the defensive line, the Ukrainians have in, in a number of places. And uh, the, uh, they're, 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 they're going to be getting some long range uh, weapons that, that are capable of hitting at long range, including hitting Ukraine. And that's the reason why the Black Sea Fleet is leaving Sevastopol. Uh, I, uh, it's, um, you know, war is, uh, unpredictable. 
And uh, I, I don't know if they can, if they can break through. They've, it's, it's quite an achievement that they broke through the first defensive line. Uh, and uh, in theory, the, the subsequent lines are less formidable. But we, we have to base uh, our assessments on what we hear each day. I just, uh, we just can't, can't be sure. But of course, if there is a major breakthrough, then events could move very quickly. Now, uh, what was the second question? The, that could a success of Ukraine unite Russians against them and, and perhaps... I don't to... think it, yeah, could it unite Russians against them? I think that uh, the, the Russians united against the Nazis because the Nazis began carrying out atrocities that were so terrible that they, they, were, they were even worse than what, what the Stalin regime had done. And uh, there's nothing like that in the, uh, in the actions of the Ukrainians. The Russians are aware that they're fighting on Ukrainian soil. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's a big mystery to me what is the state of mind of the Russian people. I just talked to someone who said that 15% are absolutely committed to the war, 15% oppose the war, and 70% uh, just want it all to end somehow. Uh, I don't think the conditions here this are, are such that uh, Russians are going to r rally around uh, this regime. We saw what happened with Prigozhin. When there, those forces entered Rostov, they, were, they, they got a, a rousing welcome from the population. And they, got, and they were welcomed all along the route on the way to Moscow. That indicates to me that support for the regime is not that strong. And a, and a surge of patriotism under these conditions in which people know that Russia was not attacked, but on the contrary is attacking, uh, I don't think that's likely. Now there was a third question. Yes, that a possible regime collapse, is that really good? Uh, well, we regime... Could somebody worse or what could is be it? a civil war? Yeah, yeah, I mean, first of all, I don't know what could be worse than Putin, frankly. Uh, I think you could get actually worse people than Putin, I'm sorry to say that, but... Prigozhin, maybe. Well... You know, um, maybe, maybe. I mean, this is all, all theoretical. Uh, and what do we mean by regime collapse? Uh, if Putin is replaced, it doesn't mean that the regime has collapsed. If Putin is replaced and a group comes to power that makes peace, that's not a collapse. That's a collapse of the Putin regime but it's not civil war. I don't think the conditions exist in Russia for civil war. I'll give you an example. People talk about the breaking away of the national republics, but take a republic like, for example, Dagestan, which has, where, where has provided a lot of soldiers for this war. There are about 80 different nationalities in Dagestan. They all speak different languages. They, in every mountain valley, and the only thing that unites them is the Russian language. Uh, there's no sentiment in Dagestan for with, you know, withdrawing from, from Russia. And the situation is similar in each, you know, there, there are different conditions in different places. Uh, so, so you don't agree that we should decolonize Russia because sometimes we hear this. <laughs> well, we, I, I, Russia ought to decolonize in the sense that those areas like Chechnya that want to be separate should be allowed to be separate because that, in, in order to encourage the democratization of, the, of what's left. But the idea that uh, there'll be a collapse because Putin is removed, uh, and a different group comes into power, uh, or that an end to the war will be unpopular, I'm not sure any of that is true. Uh, of course, we, uh, it would only, 
it's hard for me to picture a diehard group massing public support and, and, and taking on a regime that wanted to make peace. I was told an interesting story. Uh, since the uh, beginning of the war, uh, Russians have bought 23 million Chinese iPhones and they work very badly. Uh, and people are very unhappy with them. And what's true of the Chinese iPhones is true with a, of a lot of things that have been replaced uh, yeah, as, a, as a result of Western sanctions. Anyone who comes to power is going to understand perfectly well that the country's future economic development requires reintegration with the West. So I don't think any of those, I, I'm, I, I don't see those scenarios as very likely. Uh, I think the best scenario is anything that would be, that would replace Putin and that would lead them to make peace. Thank you, David. Uh, would Stephen or Attila like to chime in? Okay. Well, uh, I would open up the floor to the audience, and I think the best way we should go forward is perhaps have three questions after each other. Uh, you could uh, uh, please say who you refer the question to, to a person or the whole panel, uh, and also kind of, uh, so you can please introduce yourself. So I think the first one was the gentleman there in the green uh, shirt. Um, thank you very much. This is uh, a question uh, for David. Obviously next year, an election year, we've already heard Ramaswamy, Trump to some extent, suggesting they're going to dial down support for Ukraine. How profound do you think uh, a change in the White House would be to the war effort? First, let's get two other questions. So, to be a bit far, I think, uh, yes, uh, Stephen here. Uh, uh, Stephen Klimchuk, Dan Newb Institute Visiting Fellow. This has been an absolutely riveting uh, discussion. Uh, so I address this to David, uh, who already alluded to it at the beginning, and to the panel in general. Uh, so obviously another shoe has dropped this, this week with the terrible events in the Middle East. Uh, I think it is probably something being looked on favorably in Moscow today. It plays, plays to their strengths. So I, I guess my question is, um, how, how do you see this? Uh, of course, this is all still unfolding, but uh, how might this affect uh, Russia and the Ukraine war? And secondly, since it's likely that the Iranians were involved in uh, what Hamas has done, uh, and given the Russian connections to Hamas, uh, are there any thoughts about whether, in a very covert way, Russia might have been involved? And I think the gentleman here in the blue uh, shirt. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chung Chung Nguyen. I am doing my MA at Alta University in Budapest. And my question is directed towards the Americans of the panel. Um, I remember an essay written in Foreign Affairs by John Mearsheimer that alleges that the Euromaidan uh, protests is a covert operation by the US to depose uh, Yanukovych. And that line of narrative has been repeated by many who are realists and Ukraine skeptics uh, during the war. So I'd like to ask you to, I guess, clarify the facts in regards to this particular sequence of events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, David, would you take the honors of going through the three questions? <laughs> wow. Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, about the U.S. Uh, situation. Uh, uh, we, of course, the, the, it's impossible to know what, where, where the war will be uh, in a year or in when, it, when a new president comes into office. Uh, the, the situation on the ground could be very different. Uh, Trump has a, if, let's say Trump is the president, he does uh, have a history of uh, saying very stupid things and then doing things that are not so stupid. Uh, we saw this in when he won in 2016, made remarks that 
that no president had ever made. He said, for example, that, yeah, well, we kill a lot of people too. So he w it was almost a signal to the, to the Russians, go ahead and assassinate anyone you want. Uh, but after, what, what, once in office, in fact, it was he who, gave, who made the decision to give the first arms shipments to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the presence of those Javelin missiles made a big difference uh, when the war broke out. Uh, and that was, that, was, that was Trump's doing. So I would say that his, you know, he's a very unconventional character and what he says now is very irresponsible, but he, he, he has a long history of making irresponsible. <laughs> I, I, the, the most we could hope for is that he won't act on his irresponsible remarks. Now, um, on the subject of possible connections between Russia and Hamas, uh, there is a very sinister history of contacts between Russia and Islamic terrorist groups. Uh, uh, Zawahiri spent six months in Chechnya after taking part in the plot to assass in the assassination of Sadat in Egypt before going on to join Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan at a time when he was wanted all over the world. Uh, the, the ties between Iran and Russia now are, are quite close as, as evidenced by the fact that Iran is a major source of drones for Russia. So it's not uh, out of the question that they knew about or in some way facilitated this attack. On the other hand, there's no evidence for that either. Um, and until such evidence, we don't even have conclusive evidence of, in the case of Iran. So I think it's way too early to make any, draw any conclusions about that. But we should be aware that Russia does not view terrorists with the same repugnance that we do because they're terrorists themselves. And they engage in terrorist acts. Uh, and they don't value human life, their own or anyone else's. So it would not be surprising, but on the other hand, we don't know. Now, a final question about Euromaidan uh, and about John Mersheimer. He, oh, he uh, without wanting to be rude, um, he, he, this guy, well, I won't be rude. All right, but the, as far as the, the Euromaidan situation is concerned, there are many aspects of what happened there that are not really known to a wide public. But the one thing that didn't happen there was any kind of American plot. Uh, the, the events unfolded in a completely different way. I was there at the time in, Euro, in, in, in Kiev and in Euromaidan. And uh, uh, the United States, uh, <clears throat> really you know, did not have any big problems with Yanukovych. And uh, the, you know, despite, despite his corruption, uh, and uh, the, the, the real drive was inside the Ukrainian uh, political situation. The, uh, the there, what happened on the night of the sniper massacre is something that's going to have to be investigated uh, after the war is over, because the you know there are many aspects of it that are that are are suspicious and shocking. But rather than even get into that now, all I could tell you is that what happened in Ukraine was an internal Ukrainian, uh, and. American uh, participation in it was just as superficial uh, as our participation in foreign uh, events usually is. 
uh, where we don't get, where, 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 when it's a question of understanding foreign countries and influencing their politics, we just don't have that kind of expertise, even at, at any level in the United States government. Well, we have, we have expertise when it comes to a military confrontation, finally. Stephen, would you like to sure. chime in as an American? Sure, yeah, just very briefly. I'll go in reverse order with the last question first, yeah. uh, which is, uh, uh, yeah, whenever, whenever one of these episodes going back to Guatemala, the United Fruit Company, or all the rest of these for 40 years, I always say, I wish our CIA and foreign policy apparatus had half the capability that's depicted in Hollywood movies, where they're always the geniuses pulling the strings behind the scene. No, it's much more a Keystone Cops operation, is to put it more rough. Right. Well, <laughs> right. Uh, I think even those are overstated. But in this particular case, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of Mearsheimer either. Um, I, I am a well, I, I would say I'm a little, I'm a little grumpy about Ukraine. That's completely irrelevant to the war question that's on our mind. But uh, here, here's an odd tidbit: the number one foreign country source of contributions in after 2000 to the Clinton Foundation was Ukraine. Uh, wh what was the interest of Ukraine in the Clinton Foundation? That's a little, and then of course, you know, we're all convulsed right now in uh, the president's son being on the very well-paid director of Ukrainian gas company. There's a lot of, I think, uh, American participation in corruption that to me really stinks. Thank <laughs> you, but, but, uh, to repeat and now gild the point I just made, I think that's utterly irrelevant to the question now. Uh, I, I, I use Churchillian lenses here, which is the moral force of the spectacle in front of us, of the character of Russia, the bravery of Ukraine, yeah. trumps all of that. I don't care about any of that at the end of the day, but it is a, a real thing to conjure with. Um, I, I, about Israel, Israel can take care of itself. Uh, and, and I mean, we'll see if the war widens. This is a prospect, but right now we're speculating about that. But about the U.S. election next year, you don't need to wait till November a year from now to wonder about what the American commitment is going to be to Ukraine. You only need to wait, wait about 30 days. So you may be following this. Our, our House of Representatives is essentially closed down right now. No business can be done until they select a speaker. And the, the budget process, I'm going to skip over any details of that and simply say that as of right now, uh, Ukraine, further Ukraine aid is in suspense. I'll put it that way. And I'm not clear if there, this could be a train wreck over this uh, it, 30 days from now, never mind 12 months from now. Uh, and it, it's going to be an election campaign. I, Ramaswamy's not going to win, but whoever does, this is going to be a live issue and a big problem, I think, especially for Republicans. I want to make one one uh, uh, ob observation. Hunter Biden, or <laughs> no, no. I think that the Ukrainians regret uh, the the extent to you know that what happened. You know the with all the they they fell into the idea that that or they swallowed the idea that uh, Trump was pro Putin and reacted as some elements in by trying to. To on the other hand, throw whatever weight they had uh, behind uh, his opponent, and um, I think you know. And this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning: it doesn't pay to get involved in U.S. internal politics, and I think they under they understand that now. Attila, oh, I have only one remark on the Israel, uh, the aggression against Israel and the effects on Ukraine. So uh, one thing is quite clear, and I think uh, we should never forget it. The US is a global power, with global interests. Ukraine is one of the crises of what uh, the US is, has to face as a global power. And uh, Israel, I think from an internal political uh, point of view, is maybe even more important, since Israeli-US uh, relations are very deep. Uh, will it affect uh, the help uh, to Ukraine? That's, a, that's the question. Uh, you know, I'm, mm, I think Israel is a very strong country, of course, with a very strong military. But if the, if the conflict widens to Hezbollah, what is Ukraine missing? What is one thing that Ukraine really doesn't have enough? It's air defense. What is going to be used up 
if Hezbollah joins in with 10 times or even more than 10 times of the rockets than, uh, than, uh, uh, than what Hamas has, is air defense. So I think air defense, if, you, if the US wants to help on the long term Israel air defense, then it's a problem. Uh, you can say that Israeli Iron Dome is, is, is an Israeli uh, uh, system. Well, actually, 75% of the Tamir rocket is made in the US. A lot of the things Israeli military uses, it's Israeli innovation, Israeli brains, but US hardware is in it. We always forget that Israel is not self-sufficient on most weapon systems without the US. So it's an issue. I, you know, I'm not... Uh, private to internal information, but definitely uh, if you look back in history, it's US uh, military aid helped Israel and saved Israel uh, not once uh, in history or outside military. So it's going to be an issue if there is a widened uh, conflict, which includes Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is one league above uh, Hamas in terms of uh, capabilities. And again, to me, there is something, I have a very bad feeling about what happened, not only because of the massacre itself, what uh, Hamas, because it's a massacre, but because it was done purposefully. So it was done to have a war, which cannot be ended easily. It, it's absolutely clear to me it was not a mistake how they attacked this festival, how they attacked the kibbutz. They did it just to have a big war. Uh, um, if I, well, you know, and if there is a big war, it will include uh, not only Hezbollah, but as a proxy, definitely Iran, maybe Russia, but, you know, we always uh, miss one country out of the game, and one country which is really powerful now, in the, or coming into the Middle East, that's China. So, we just don't know the, what happened behind the scenes. And most of the things we discuss, uh, I was in government positions for 20 years, most of what the press discusses is usually a tip of the iceberg. We don't know what really happened, who decided, why this terrible provocation was done, uh, and what if there is a plan. Because sometimes there is a plan, and some, most of the time I agree, true with Maidan and the CIA, most of the plan for many governments and agencies, the plan that there is no plan. But sometimes there is a plan. So we don't know if the, if the plan that there is no plan for Hamas and Iran, or if they have a plan. So we're going to see it in the next few months. Uh, but if there is a plan, and if the plan continues maybe around Taiwan or the South China Sea, then we're going to have not one crisis, Ukraine, not two crises, but maybe even three crises. Uh, of course, I'm writing books also, which are fiction and geopolitical fiction, so that's why I'm... I'm thinking a bit out of the box, but is it possible? Do we think that, uh, that uh, the Russians did it without conduct, uh, uh, concluding a deal with, the, with China? They attack Ukraine just like this and not talking to China, or all this is happening, just Hamas decided without con uh, uh, consulting or speaking to Tehran, and Tehran did not speak to Moscow or what is more important to Beijing? We don't know, but just let's think out of the box and if, if, if uh, I think it's unlikely, because usually that there, is, there is no plan. But if there is a plan, we can be in trouble. Not only Ukraine, but we as a West can be in trouble. And about Professor Mitchheimer, I don't agree with him on Maidan. I think it was a genuine internal, Ukra started by Ukrainians, and actually opposed by Ukrainians to a very large degree. So 50 some percent supported Maidan, and there was on the East a very large anti-Maidan, supported by Russian propaganda, but also coming out of, of their own frustration. So it's, uh, it's not only Russians uh, doing everything because that they are not that powerful like the CIA either, and they are showing it in Ukraine every day. So, so that's, that's a very, very big issue, I think, the Israeli, uh, the, the attack against, the aggression against Israel. Uh, and, and, and there can be other conflicts coming out of this. And how many conflicts the West can handle? And what Mirsheimer is saying, in, I think he's wrong on Maidan, but on seeing the heartland power coming together, uh, China, uh, Russia, and, uh, and uh, Iran, and some other smaller uh, players, North Korea, the North Koreans are providing uh, Russia today, according to Western sources, the trains, three times more trains are going to, to Russia. So 
Is it just, just a coincidence or if, if there is something more in it? We will see. Uh, I hope that there is no plan. That's, that's my hope, but I'm not sure about that. Thank you. Well, sadly, we are out of time, but if, if Stephen, you want to make some last... Okay. Uh, so please uh, join me in thanking the audience. I was talking about speakers. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, miss... miss uh, let me spell this. <laughs> so please join me in thanking our speakers, David, Attila, Stephen. Thank you very much for being with us uh, and for your interesting insights. Thank you.